So Colossians 2, verses 13 through 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. I don't want to set the world on fire. I just want to start a flame in you. Good morning. Welcome, welcome to worship at LaCroix today. Uh, back in, in, the, uh, in the 70s, boxing was huge, and I was a big fan. I guess right behind baseball uh, was my favorite sport. Okay, not right behind, but you know, baseball way up there. But I love, I love boxing, and if you're younger, you may not realize that because it's kind of fallen off the face of the, the earth in terms of uh, uh, publicity. But in the 70s, it was big. And uh, uh, the biggest of all the fights in the 70s was something called the Rumble in the Jungle, a uh, fight between the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world, undefeated George Foreman, uh, and then Muhammad Ali, 32 years old, seven years older than, than Foreman, and uh, a, a one to four underdog. Of, uh, Foreman uh, was... was uh, a, Pick to choose. I mean, he was a four to one favorite, and that was even before he came out with his grill. I mean, so uh, you know, this was this was a big deal. And uh, Ali had been the champ before. Uh, not many people gave him much of a chance in this particular fight. A billion people turned into wa- watched that fight. It was the the biggest broadcast sporting event of its time, and I was in that billion watching uh, from here. It was a more, it was a Saturday morning in October, 1974, um, and this the most anticipated fight. Everybody was talking about this fight, and Ali comes out and he does something that nobody expected. He retreats to the ropes and he just begins to lay against the ropes as Foreman, who was considered the hardest hitting guy there was in that time, begins to pound away uh, at his arms at his side, and and but yet it's really not accomplishing much because what Foreman doesn't know is that the ropes are capturing most of the, uh, uh, of the, the, the impact of those hits. And so he just lays against the ropes. He later called it his rope-a-dope strategy. First time it had ever been seen. And we're watching this first round, second round, third round and say, what is Ali doing? Come on, this is not a fight. This is one guy swinging a guy who's laying up against the ropes. This makes no sense. It, it was just crazy. Um, and so <clears throat> we picture uh, the, a fight. We didn't picture that. Well, if I were to say, can you in your mind picture what would it look like for God to come and finally conquer evil? What would that look like in your mind? Guns blazing, fire and smoke, maybe legions upon legions of angels coming um, to fight. And instead we get the cross. No one saw that coming. No one expected that. Nobody had any idea that God's method of defeating evil was the cross. But that's exactly what he did. And a scripture reading you heard this said, this note from Paul, he says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Triumph. Um, the, the gospel writers really had this theme. There's different theories about um, what happened at the cross. The New Testament doesn't give us a theory, but down through the years, theologians just can't help themselves and they come up with these theories like what really took place at the cross? What really was happening there that results in the the salvation of the world and the forgiveness of sins? And there's different theories. There's there's a substitutionary atonement theory. There is the uh, uh, ransom theory. There's the the moral influence theory. All of these things, we study these in seminary, you know? And again, the Bible doesn't lay one out, uh, but there, one, one... Person, one theory that we think most of the early church fathers believed is one that is, is, is in the Gospels. It's not really, the Gospels just tell us the event. They don't give a theory to it. But some have called it Christus Victor, Christ the Victor. That what the Gospels are trying to tell us and what happened at the cross is that Jesus was utterly and completely victorious in his conquest of evil. And so today what I want to do is I want to come, I want to come to the cross 
And I want to look at it from a different perspective. I want to look at it from a different angle. Normally, when we talk about the cross resulting in the forgiveness of sins, we think of sins as individual actions. If I lie to somebody, that's a sin. If I steal something, that's a sin. If I have lust in my heart, that's a sin. If I, you know, if I have greed, then that's a sin. Those are individual sins. And yes, that's, that's very, very true. But the New Testament also talks about this other reality that's summed up with words like the principalities and powers. The, the, the powers and authorities. That, that to sin, not only is there sin, sins, individual actions, but there's sin, the power of sin. Have you ever noticed that when you get into sin, that sin gets into you and it seems to have a control over people and, it, and we have addictive behavior and we have habit, habits that we just can't seem to break and the, that sin has a power, that's a power. But this, this power of sin also gets into all human institutions and organizations and it gets really kind of difficult and twisted at times. That's the powers of sin that he talks about here in Colossians. So we want to talk about that as we continue this series, Good God? Question mark. Is God really good? And where some people stumble in being able to answer that affirmatively is around the issue of suffering and evil. Last week we talked about suffering. And we think of that as kind of individual setbacks, right? And, and disease or, or hardship, some kind of calamity, some kind of setback, and of course, the ultimate death itself. But then we think of evil. And, and how, how, can, how can a good God allow things like the Holocaust? Or the killing fields of Cambodia? Or the starvation of Ukraine by Stalin and millions of people died? How, how is that even possible? How, how does God allow this? How can this be? How can God be good with all of this? We think of sex trafficking and child abuse and racism and school shootings and terrorism. You know, our world didn't want to talk about evil for a long time. In America, at least it had kind of fallen out of fashion to speak of evil. And then 9-11 happened. And how do we come up with language to describe people hijacking airplanes full of passengers and flying them into buildings? And suddenly evil became part of our vocabulary again. So how do you reconcile that with belief in good God? The only way to answer that question is the cross. The cross settles this question once and for all. And so what I want to do today is look at the cross in a new light. I want to come at it from a bit of a different angle. And I want to see what I think the gospels in their totality and their telling of the story convey to us and then what Paul is trying to help us understand here in Colossians. I want to talk about the conquest of evil. I want to talk about Christ the victor. So how, first I was, how did he do it? How he did it? Uh, secondly, the mission he fulfilled. And then thirdly, what it means for you and me. So how did he do it? How did Christ defeat evil at the cross? Uh, well, he had a daring plan, a bold plan. And that was to draw evil from every different source and every different avenue to pull it all together to a point and bring it to this one place at Golgotha, Calvary, and deal with it there. And so what we see happening on Good Friday is evil unleashed and given full reign like it had never been in, in human history. And it's not just one sort of evil coming from one direction. It's coming from all different directions converging at the cross. I, wanna, I want us to see five different directions that evil is coming in, with the focal point of it being Jesus coming at him. And the first is political. Um, from the time Jesus is born, there's this tension with the political powers that be. We know the stories from Jesus' birth that, that when the wise men come looking for Jesus, that King Herod the Great hears about this, and he was uh, king over the Jews. He considered himself king of the Jews, and he was placed there by Rome, and, and he was terribly insecure. And when he found out that a child was born in Bethlehem, uh, who would be king of the Jews, he has every male child with, under the age of two killed in Bethlehem. 
So the storm clouds are definitely on the horizon. Jesus comes into his ministry, and the first message he preaches is, repent and believe the good news. Good news means gospel. He starts proclaiming the gospel. Well, interestingly, uh, the Roman emperors referred to their reign as the gospel, as the reign of the good news. Jesus takes that language and instead applies it to him, which puts him in direct confrontation. He starts talking about a kingdom. He tells stories that we call parables about, and he'll say things like, the kingdom of God can be compared to this, or the kingdom of heaven is like this. Kingdom? Oh, this is the day of Rome. One empire over the whole world. So Jesus is setting himself up in, with, in conflict with the, politi- the, 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 the political powers that be. And it culminates at his trial when he stands before Pilate, the representative of the Roman Empire in Palestine, the most powerful empire ever to be on the face of the earth. And and Jesus is standing before Pilate, this very powerful man, and you get the impression from the encounter that Pilate is the one who's rattled, that Jesus is really in control. When Jesus wouldn't speak, when he wouldn't talk, Pilate says, don't you understand that I have the power to have you killed? And Jesus says, you would have no power except that was given to you from above. Pilate wants to let him go. He's deeply troubled. His wife had dreams about him. He knows he's innocent. And yet the crowds cry out, crucify him. And he can't stand up to the crowds symbolically washes his hands and says, it's on you. And he condemns Jesus to die. If there ever was a miscarriage of justice, if there ever was an unjust trial, trials that took place at night, some kangaroo court that was thrown together, it was that. And so we see the evil in the political system coming out. But... They're in alignment with the religious system. And so this comes at at, at Jesus and converges at the cross. Now something's really wrong with this in that that the religious system was really to be the answer that God had brought uh, an answer into the world and that was to come through the the, the, uh, preaching of the gospel. Uh, the, The religious system, but it got evil. What happens when those who are supposed to be good turn evil? What happens with that? We see that in stories, right? It makes for some great storylines. See it in Lord of the Rings when one of the wizards turns against the good ones and you've got this problem because it complicates things. And so you have political, you have religious, and you have Jesus being brought before the house of Caiaphas. Caiaphas was corrupt as a priest and he gets in cahoots with with Herod. He hated Herod. Herod and Caiaphas hated each other, but they came, became buddies on that day, as it said before, that politics makes for strange bedfellows. And on that day, the political and religious authorities were all united in their opposition to Jesus. Um, but it wasn't just that. There were other forces at work that were invisible to the eye, but very present. There was the demonic We see hints of that in Jesus' ministry. He goes to heal people and demons come shrieking out of individuals. Demons speak and he tells them to be quiet and and tells them not to reveal who he was. And then we get to this night when Jesus is betrayed in the garden and, and Jesus says, am I leading a rebellion that you've come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you didn't lay a hand on me, but this is your hour when darkness reigns. Converging at the cross was a insidious evil. When one of his friends and disciples was at the meal with him, Judas Iscariot, he takes bread and dips it in the cup with Jesus, and Jesus says, whatever you're going to do, do it quickly. Judas gets up from the meal, and it said at that point that Satan entered him. We see the demonic at the cross when people are walking by sneering and ridiculing Jesus. 
Oh, if you're the son of God, why don't you come down from there and save yourself? The thieves on the cross also were saying the same thing. Save us and save yourself if you are who you say you are. And so present that day was the, all the forces of evil. And then, and then there was the relational. I've already hinted at it. We get a picture through Judas Iscariot, but Jesus comes into his ministry and he gathers 12 disciples, 12 men who will be with him and do life together. And, and uh, uh, he's going to train them and, 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 and uh, prepare them to, to lead and to preach the gospel around the world. But you get, it from the, you get this picture from the beginning that they really don't get it. They're confused and, and they, they, have, they fight among themselves. They have arguments about who's the greatest. James and John even pull a good one one day. They bring their mom along and say, hey, would you make one of us sit at the right and the other at the left? Mom wants us to, you know? And, and they, they, it's just they fight and they just don't get it. And one day, Peter, who was that guy who always spoke up first before he thought, you know, people like that? <laughs> they, think, they speak before they think. Well, Peter is there and Jesus says, um, who do people say that I am? And they tell him the different theories and then, he, and then he says, well, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up and says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, um, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. In other words, good job. He goes to the head of the class. He got the answer right. Um, but before too long, before the, the joy of that moment can settle in, Jesus begins to talk about the, what he's going to do, that he's going to go to Jerusalem, that he'll be betrayed by the chief priests, by the religious authorities, and turned over to the Romans, and he'll suffer and die. And Peter decides he doesn't like this plan, so he pulls Jesus aside to rebuke him for this. May I suggest you don't pull Jesus aside and rebuke him, okay? And what does Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. Just moments before, he went to the head of the class. Now he's sitting in the corner with a dunce hat on. They, they just didn't get it. But we really see the ultimate failure of Jesus' friends at the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus is arrested and he's, and he's uh, uh, brought, uh, the, the crowds come, the mob, they come, and his disciples, they scatter. Scatter to the winds. Um, Judas has already betrayed him with a kiss. Jesus said, you would betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Earlier that night, he said that they would all desert him, and Peter stands up and says, I'll never desert you. In fact, everybody else here may, but I won't. And Jesus said, oh, really? Before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And that's what happened. Jesus, Peter follows from a distance as Jesus is taking off to the high, taking off to the high priest Caiaphas and out in the courtyard three times he denies that he even knew Jesus. Utter and complete failure of Jesus' friends. Only John is even there at the cross. You know, we say that uh, we're made for community and at LaCroix we like this phrase, we thrive in community and God made us together. You can't live the Christian life on your own. There's no such thing as solo Christianity but the reality is Relationships can get tricky too, right? They can get messed up. Envy, jealousy, pride. Other things can get in the middle of our relationships and fracture relationships. Uh, put friends against one another. Jesus is betrayed, and forever the name Judas Iscariot will, will be synonymous with betrayal. You ever been betrayed? You know what hurts about betrayal? Only a friend can betray a friend. And Jesus experiences all of that. But there was more. There was the social aspect of evil that came at him with all of its fury and the cross itself the degradation of it all you see the reality is we, we Americans uh, have nothing in America we have nothing to compare to a crucifixion thankfully we are not exposed to such cruelty awfulness we just don't see it. Death is kind of sanitized in America. We kind of get it out of sight, out of view. 
There was a time in our history, in our nation's history, believe it or not, not long ago, maybe our great-great-grandparents, they would go to hangings, sort of a form of entertainment, you know, and uh, um, they would watch public hangings. That boggles our mind to think of that today. But even that is nothing compared to a crucifixion. See, when we think of crucifixion, especially with Americans, and when we start talking about it, we focus in on the pain. Because, and indeed, um, crucifixion was one of the most horrific ways that a person could die. The Romans perfected the art of torture. And there was nothing more inhumane or painful than crucifixion. In fact, our word excruciating comes from, it literally means out of the cross, excruciating. But you know what? The biblical writers don't talk about the pain that Jesus experienced, the physical pain. Never, never comes up. That wasn't what stood out to them. It was something else. In her book, The Crucifixion, um, Fleming Rutledge quotes Susan Sontag, who suffered from a long battle with cancer, a cancer that eventually took her life. And Susan wrote this. She goes, it's not suffering as such that is most deeply feared, but suffering that degrades. No, nobody wants to go through a humiliating, degrading death. Maybe you've talked with parents or grandparents who've had that fear and how they just, that, that, that horrifies us. Well, Rutledge goes on to say, here in a few words is a fundamental insight into which to view the crucifixion. If Jesus' demise is construed merely as a death, even as a painful, tortured death, the crucial, the central point is missed. Crucifixion was specifically designed to be the ultimate insult to personal dignity. The last word in humiliating and dehumanizing treatment, degradation was the whole point. She quotes a Bible scholar, Joel Green, who said, executed publicly, situated at a major crossroads on a well-trafficked artery, devoid of clothing, left to be eaten by birds and beasts, victims of crucifixion were subject to optimal, unmitigated, vicious ridicule. The whole point of crucifixion was to ridicule the condemned, to humiliate them to the uttermost. No portrait of the cross does it justice. First of all, Jesus had no clothing. It's a humiliating experience. And he carries all of that and the shame. And all of this comes rushing in on that day. There was no day like that day that we now call Good Friday. There was no day like it in, in the history of the world. So dark was that day, so present, so free of a rain, evil was given that the sun even refused to shine for three of the hours that Jesus was on the cross. Darkness had assembled from every direction and was there, present for the death of the Son of God. And he Wright. The scholar writes this, the Gospels tell this whole story in order to say that the tortured young Jewish prophet hanging on the cross was the point where evil had become truly and fully and totally itself. Jesus faced the greatest darkness and evil the world has ever seen. You say, okay, I see that Jesus saw that, but, but how does that become the solution? It's a good question. And to answer that, you've got to look at the mission that he fulfilled. And you've got to tell the deeper, more complex story. A deeper, complex story that I can't even begin to uh, get to the depths of, but let me just try for a moment. You see, when human beings fell and sin entered our race and we were banished from paradise. God immediately began to seek restoration and reconciliation. And so, um, because he 
dwelt with them in the garden. His goal has always been to dwell again and among his people again. Um, he decides that his plan is going to be this. He's going he's to raise up a whole new people, a whole new race. And, and he's going to give his message to the world through this people. And so he calls a man by the name of Abram, who later has his name changed to Abraham. And he doesn't have any children, but he eventually has one son, Isaac, and he is promised that his descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, and that through this people, this chosen people, the people of Israel, as they would later be known, that, that, that the message that he wanted to get to the world would be delivered through them, that they would show the world what it means uh, to know God and love God and have a relationship with God, to love him and be loved by him. They would show the world what God was like. They would be a light to the nations. <laughs> Only one problem. Time after time after time, they failed in the mission. God made a covenant with them, and they broke the covenant. God made another covenant with them. They broke the covenant. They couldn't fulfill their end of the story. Um, Israel failed over and over again. It's the whole story of our Old Testament. Unless we become proud, we too would have failed. No pointing fingers here. But this was the reality. This nation that was to be a city set on a hill, a light that could not be hidden, had failed, so what does God do? The author of the story steps into the story. The Bible only has one hero. That's Jesus. There's only one sinless man. That's him. All the other characters in the Bible are exposed. Their feet of clay are exposed, if not early on, eventually. However, there is one righteous man in the Old Testament. A mysterious figure in the book of Isaiah who simply referred to as my servant. We have since come to call him the suffering servant. And that this servant would somehow step into the role that Israel was supposed to fill and fulfill it that this servant would do what Israel was unable to do. You can go to the book of Isaiah, start about chapter 40, and you'll see several references to this servant, written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. And you can read about him. But his story is, mo is told most clearly in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And it goes something like this. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him or beauty that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Um, but he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, and he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shears is silent, so he does not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he is taken away. With wicked men, he was assigned in his death, in his, in his grave, yet with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. 
But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. My servant will justify the many and take away their transgressions. Little did the crowds know, gathered in Jerusalem on that day, that this prophet from Nazareth carrying a cross through the road on a path that later would be named the Via Della Rosa, the way of sorrows, the way of suffering. Little did they know that this prophet was that servant, that he had stepped in to do what they could not do, that he was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Um, and he goes to the cross. And he does everything that he tells us to do on the Sermon on the Mount. He is cursed, but he does not curse back. He is reviled, but he does not revile. He loves his enemies. He turns the other cheek. He goes the extra mile. He gives his cloak and his tunic and everything. He prays for his tormentors. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Paul later would write in his, one of his letters, um, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's exactly what happened on the cross. It's that Jesus overcame evil with good. He did not fight back. He turned the other cheek. He did not curse. He did not strike back. He absorbed it all. And he took it into himself. And he carried it. He disarmed it. And that's what um, Paul is trying to tell us. Again, we look at this verse. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You see, they thought, what's that, what that's referring to is the Roman victory procession. When Roman armies would win a battle, they would come back to Rome and celebrate, and they would march the armies in this great procession. And in the front would be the general, and the armies would follow behind, and they would go through the Ark of Triumph, and, and coming behind them were the prisoners of war and the king from that nation who would be executed at the end of the parade. And the authorities of that day, the powers, thought that this was Jesus, that they had paraded him through Jerusalem, and that they had utterly humiliated him. But what they don't understand is that in his very actions, he paraded them through the street. He made a public spectacle of evil and triumphed over it. That's victorious language when you think about it. Today after the Super Bowl, if they say one of the teams made a public spectacle of the other, that's a pretty convincing victory, right? Can we hope that for both teams today? Huh? You know, I, yeah, I, 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 you know, I think I'm going to skip this Super Bowl. I don't like either one of these teams, you know. I, I just don't know. I don't think I can watch it, you know. Um, thankfully, uh, Fox Sports Midwest is rebroadcasting game six of the 2011 World Series, and so you can watch that instead. We're going to celebrate like it's 2011 at our household tonight, okay? Um, but what happened? At the cross was that evil was spent. A rumble in the jungle. Two rounds, four rounds. Muhammad Ali is against the ropes. Foreman is hitting away and is running out of steam by the round. Sixth round, seventh round. Ali's on the ropes. The eighth round, Foreman is just exhausted. 
comes out to fight, and this time Ali meets him in the center of the ring. And he's, he's skipping and he's dancing. And he hits him with a left jab, three left jabs. And then he hits him with one of his patented right hooks, right to the jaw, and then a left, and another right. And Foreman does something that he never did before in, his hist- in the history of his career. He fell to the canvas. He was defeated because he was spent. And what happens on the cross is that evil was spent. It threw all that it had to throw at him and Jesus responded with love every step of the way. And so three days later, later he rises from the dead. Why is that? Why did Jesus rise? People, you know, have thought about that. It, it, was it because that was God's way of vindicating him and saying, well done, good and faithful servant? No. Although it was a good job. Was, was it the fact that Jesus is God incarnate? He's God in the flesh. He's the second person of the Trinity. Of course he would conquer death. No. He conquered death because evil spent everything that it had. What is the greatest expression of evil in this world? It is death. What do you look at the word live? Spell it backwards. What do you get? What is evil? Evil is defacing everything that is good about God's good creation. That's what evil is. It defaces and tears down what is good. Jesus said it this way about the thief. He says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You want to look at the fingerprints of the enemy? You will see these things. He steals. He robs life. He kills He murders. Jesus said the thief was a murderer from the beginning and he he destroys, he tears things down. God, though, gives. He's the creator. And the next scene after creation, he's in the garden, tending the garden, bringing life out of the ground. He, He gives life. He builds up. And like I said, the greatest expression of evil is death. Paul calls it the last enemy, the great enemy. And so Jesus rises from the dead because evil had nothing left. Conquered it. So what does this mean for us? Well, more than I can tell you in the last couple minutes I have. First thing it means for us is that we can live with the confidence that there is a greater power in this world than the power of evil. And there may be times when we think that evil wins, but there is a greater force in this world. It's a power of love. Love wins. Love won on that day. A love will win in the end. Also for us, this place, this cross, becomes a new temple where heaven meets earth. Because it wasn't just Jesus who goes to the cross because the Father makes him do that. No, within the heart of the Father is the, is the cruciform figure. Within the heart of the Holy Spirit is the cruciform Christ. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is defined by self-giving, self-sacrificing love that gives to the uttermost. And The cross now for us becomes a place of pilgrimage where we come to gaze upon the beauty and the greatness of God's love. Yes, there's suffering and there's heartache, but the question of God's goodness is forever taken away and shaped into the form of a cross. You want to know what God is really like. You want to know, look at the cross and you'll see everything you need to know. Love poured out, love poured out for enemies, love for us. Um, But it means more than that. We go back to our text in Colossians. He says this, when you were dead in your sins and in this uncircumcision of your heart, God made you alive with Christ and forgave us all our sins. 
having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us as he had taken away, nailing it to the cross. And what this means is as a result of the cross today, right now, you can know the forgiveness of your sins. Right now, you can have the life of the Holy Spirit in you. And one day, one day soon, you will live in victory, complete victory, and you'll be sinless because of what God has done for us in the cross. But it means that we see reality. And that's just things as they are, really are. I've been talking about evil as something out there, over there. Let me tell you, friends. The line that separates good and evil is not between countries or ideologies or political parties. The line that separates good and evil is a line that goes right through the human heart. It's not so much about the problem of evil as it's the problem of me. And the cross settles the problem of me. So dare you stand before this cross and claim it was done for you? If you can stand before the cross and say it was done for me, you know the forgiveness of sins and you get to take part in the victory. Christ, the victor. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. How how do we, it sounds almost trite. Those words just are simply not adequate. As the old hymn writer said long ago, were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. We bow before the cross because there you, the Lamb of God, took away our sins. And not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. And you defeated sin, the power of sin in all of its ugliness. Thank you for your great victory. Thank you for the cross.